This episode of the No Name Film Show Thingy is brought to you by Live Lots from the Foster Gallery. Live Lots is an online marketplace at the Foster Gallery that provides one-time runs and monthly increments of low-cost artwork that can be bought and shipped directly to your home. Find out more at www.thefostergallery.com. Hey everybody, this is Matt Foster and this is episode 2 of uh, the No Name Film Show Thingy. What do you think, Kevin? That's what, I what... absolutely love it. I, right, I think that's... very fitting. <laughs> this, is, this is what happens when you put, you know, 0.0001% effort into, you know, research and development in your naming conventions. <laughs> so so uh, with me again, Kevin Walunas. How you doing, Kevin? I'm doing great. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. And uh, so our, our topic that we decided to try and uh, to muddle through today is, um, is film scores or music in a movie. And uh, uh, which is, once I started thinking about what I was going to you know, say as mine, I was kind of like, wow, this is probably too broad of a topic. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, like yeah. I started realizing how much I liked um, out there yeah. for film music. That was more or less my problem too. I had to really narrow it down. Okay. Well, well, uh, were you able to think of stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I got mine was more. Now this this was a little. This is actually a newer movie, and um, Drive that just came out, 2011, yep. with uh, Ryan Gosling. A lot of people know it. Big big cult movie hit. Um, great action movie, but it was had a really really great curated soundtrack to really help the feel of that movie. Okay. I believe that soundtrack helps set up the mood and tone of that movie pretty much better than anything I've seen really recently. Um, and it really actually, they tried to go for this kind of 80s synth yeah. pop kind of style. And yeah. I think they really, really pulled it off. It helped really set the movie up. It almost feels like the movie's set in the 80s already. Yeah. So uh, it just really, really increases that feeling about the actual setting and kind of the almost cold, the cold, the synthesizers almost sound cold. Okay. In the sense that they're not human. You know, okay. it's not a human right. instrument. It's a digital instrument and it really helps set up, you know, kind of the coldness of that movie. Now, now I got to admit, I think I've seen about half of that movie. Oh, really? Yeah. I Now, uh, this is where I'm going to have to, like, say this properly. My wife and I started watching it, and I think we watched about half of it because we both fell asleep. <laughs> like, yeah. now, now, it's a slow movie, I got to yeah. say. It's just a very slow-paced movie. Yeah, and, and and I think we thought it was going to be, I mean, like what you just said, everybody tells us it's an action movie or, or a, like a suspense-type movie, you know, yes. kind of thing. Thriller. And, and I think we never got to that part. I think we ended up sitting through the setup and never getting the payoff. You know what I mean? Yeah, by, by the sounds of it, yes. yes. Yeah, okay. Because, cause, I mean, I'm trying to remember, I remember some of the, the soundtrack score going on in the beginning, but a lot of the a lot of the movie, and again, I only saw the first part of it, seemed to be a lot of him driving around and, and kind of a subtle, a lot of subtle music, I, I want to say, that, that yeah. fit into that. Um, did they end up using, splicing in, like, popular 80s music, too, or not? Uh no, for the most part, uh, a lot of it was actually an original score. Oh, okay. A lot of it was an original score made by uh, Cliff Martinez. Uh, okay. And he kind of, you know, he went for that, you know, very synth-heavy. It's a lot easier for somebody scoring a movie, too, to just, you know, do it all in synths. But, uh, sure. Um, but he did a really, really great job scoring it. But, you know, with a lot of the other tracks, like uh, Under Your Spell by Desire, which is the big the song everybody kind of remembers from it because okay. it just repeats one line over and over again. Okay. Um, you know, they're all very, it's all very poppy, but as you said, you know, it's, it's a very subtle soundtrack and it's one of those soundtracks you don't realize is there until kind of towards the end. Well, yeah, well, I mean, and I guess that's what I was getting at is, is that a, and you tell me just from the film standpoint, there are those movies that um, stick out in my mind where the music is ultra prevalent like it's just like not that the 
you know, not so much that it's a musical, yes. but that the music is trying to create a an atmosphere that's almost like competing with what's going on on screen. Yeah, you know, you got you got example examples like that are like almost I w- I would almost argue Inception. Uh, yeah. Inception, you know, everybody knows the boom, right. you know, that that one. The, they're going deeper into the dream noise. Right. Uh, but I, I don't know. Here's my here's my argument for soundtracks, and this is how I've always kind of approached it, especially when I've made my own films. Yeah. Is uh, the soundtrack and music in general should aid the story. It should not take away okay. from anything. Okay. If if you're noticing the music and not the story, and it's taking you out of the movie, I don't think it's a good thing. Okay. You should okay. be focused on the story, and it should just be helping the story and helping you feel the emotions that you know the character's feeling or the scene is setting up or something like that. You know, it should be aiding the story and not taking away from the story. Okay. That's, that's how I feel soundtrack should be. And I feel that I feel drive is a great example of one of those ones that it's, it's set up. So you feel what you, you feel basically what the driver's feeling, Ryan Gosling's character. He's not actually named fun fact. Um, And you know, you, it helps, it helps you really kind of connect with him, but it's in a way that you kind of realize the music's not almost even there. I think that, and doing that, I think is a lot harder than having really prevalent music that's trying to really help you, you know, hammer in those emotions. No, that makes, that makes sense to me. I mean, and now I'll give you one of the ones that I was going to bring up Mm -hmm. and I kind of, for my end, I kind of tried to pick something that was new and then something that was old, you know what I mean? So my new one, is the the newer Tron movie? Oh yeah, that had the music done by Daft Punk, and Absolutely. I remember now. Now I'm a Daft Punk fan. I'm a huge Daft Punk fan. And I I remember when when I heard they were going to do it, I was waiting for this over the top kind of Daft Punks. Yeah. And and for those who don't know, Daft Punk is a is an electronica type band, uh, two guys right who who do everything electronically, two, and. Two. Um, yeah, and they they normally homogenize their sound with a lot of very upbeat, radio-friendly kind of uh, breaks and riffs and things like that. That are that it's not. I don't want to say it's poppy, but it's not it's, very. It, 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 yeah. Is it? I mean. It, it, I mean. I mean. They have. You know. It's a lot of the samples they're using are a lot of samples a lot of like rappers use you know they're going right. they're going in the same pool for their samples so but they're, as far as electronica goes they're definitely not the subtle minimalist electronica uh that, that i was used to in college and stuff you know yeah. what i mean they're they're not coming from the craft work arena they're they're kind of <laughs> you know what i mean they're coming from more of a radio friendly um dance you know dance studio type thing and uh so when i heard they were going to do tron I was excited, but I was also kind of like nervous because I was like, "Great, is Tron going to become a big dance, you know, thing?" And uh, and I was really. I remember when the, it came out, people were like almost upset because it was too subtle, like it was it was too soundtrack ish. Yeah. And yeah. I was actually, yeah, I was actually thrilled that they took it that seriously. Yeah, and, no, and it <laughs> really, it really enhanced the movie. I thought. I mean, I, I thought that similar to what you're saying, it felt like you were actually in that world that they were yeah. trying to display. You know, it's it seems like Daft Punk got a great handle of that story beforehand when they got when they actually yeah. got to make that soundtrack, and I, I, my money's on they probably had a lot of conversations with either the writers or the directors or somebody in there who had a great understanding of that movie. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, even even before he goes into the computer realm, if you will, yes, yes. Um, their, their ability to kind of give you the feeling of isolationism that he had from not mm-hmm. having his dad around and all that stuff while not leaving the techno feeling out of yes. it, but not making it feel like you were in this tech world. It, it was still more of a minimal feeling. Yeah, and, and then when he gets immersed into that world, it just inflates and and turns into what it is, which which I thought was really good. I mean, I I, I very much liked it. Um, you know, I I I don't know. That's the, in in modern for a newer uh, movie. That's kind of 
the one I gravitate to for, oh yeah, I really, really got into the music, you know? Yeah, no, and I mean, I'm, I'm very much in agreement with you for that movie. I think that movie, especially that first chunk before he goes into the computer world, yeah. it feels like a, like a sci-fi noir film. It, yeah, it had a very almost Inception-y kind of feel to the beginning I of that agree. movie. And I think I think it's a great great build up. I love Jeff Bridges, so you know, great movie, great movie. But uh, the whole the whole score, and actually they they have a cameo in it too, which is cool because they are actually for people who aren't familiar with Daft Punk, they also dress up as two robots. Right. Their whole fictionalized character of Daft Punk are these two robots who are here to give us good music, basically. Right. And. Um, they actually have a cameo in the big club scene with uh, my favorite is uh, the electronic David Bowie. Yeah. There, uh, he was he was great too. But um, you know, I think I think that their whole integration of music for that was just brilliant and shows you how great a musicians and producers Daft Punk are. Really. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And and, and how they, they, what I you know like I said before, you could tell how seriously they took it. You know oh, what I mean? No, they they really took it seriously. Yeah, they so. made it so poppy sounding and they really took Tron as an idea and made a sound out of it. So so I'm going to so going back to some of the older ones, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to read you cuz I have it up on screen here cuz I'll okay. tell you I had a hard time with this like I said before. <laughs> so I actually went through some of the huh, what are the big ones, you know? Yeah. So according to AFI, which I'm assuming you would consider a good source, right? Yes. I would. Okay. Yeah, I would. Um, they had a they had a whole thing about hundred years of film, and they had different things: hundred years of thrills, of passions, all this other stuff. So it's yep. basically their top hundred list for the hundred years. Mm -hmm. So in their top ten for mm -hmm. movie scores, number one was Star Wars. Okay. Okay. Um, which is hard to complain about. I mean, yeah. John, John Williams. Yeah. Number two is Gone with the Wind. Yeah. Okay. Um, which is Max Steiner. Mm-hmm. Uh, number three is Lawrence of Arabia, which uh, one of my personal favorites. Maurice is a jar, J J A R R E jar. Yeah, I think I think I'm pretty sure it's French, so there's probably a silent letter in there yeah. somewhere. <laughs> but he, yeah, right. But he actually also did Doctor Shivago, which is one of my yep. favorite scores. I love love that movie. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, number four was Psycho. Yeah, I mean that's that's you know quintessential crazy murderer music. So, so is that is that in there because of the genre? You think? I well, I mean, it is. I don't, it is I don't really. I mean, outside of the outside of the you know the iconic you know four court you know thing that everybody knows. Yeah. I, I don't think of the rest of the music in the movie at all. You know, but maybe that's more to your point. You know. Yeah, I, I mean, I that that was a very more subtly scored movie. Up till that scene where you know the very very iconic murder scene comes up in the shower. I mean, I think that's probably number four on the list just for that movie because that was a true showing of what music could really do to really terrify people in theaters. You know. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense to me. So yeah. number five, number five is The Godfather. Yeah. Um, which is fantastic. I could definitely see that on there. Uh, Jaws is number six. Mm -hmm. Another John Williams score. Another John Williams, yep, you're right. Uh, number seven is Laura, which I guess I don't know that movie. It's a 1944 movie. Yeah, I don't know that movie either. I don't, I don't know it either. I'm going to have to go check that out. Yeah. Um, number eight is The Magnificent Seven, okay. which is Bernstein. Yeah. Um, number nine is Chinatown, which is kind of surprising to me because I, I don't really think of the music from Chinatown. Do you? I mean, yeah. So I mean, I'll have to go rewatch. I haven't, you know, in all honesty, I haven't watched that movie since I was like a teenager. So yeah, I haven't watched that in a very long time. Yeah, then, that's Jack Nicholson, right? Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. And then, uh, and then number ten is High Noon, which okay. uh, again, iconic, you know. Yes. Yes, absolutely. But um, that's a you know that's a pretty that's honestly a decently solid list, you know, especially for some of these top 100 lists and, you know, top 10 lists that come out. But I, you know, for the most part, I definitely agree for at least from a film history standpoint, those right. are probably, honestly, the top 10 scores. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, and, and of those top 10, obviously the one that I would say that I 
most, I don't know. I, I don't know if this is just because I'm most immersed in it, but, you know, Star Wars is obviously the one that I could probably name every scene as I heard the music, you know what I mean? Yeah, like that. and that's one of those things that it's, that's where, that's a movie where the music's more in your face, but really, really helps you feel what the characters are feeling or what the scene is feeling. Do you think that that's, now, as I saw that, when I first saw this <laughs> list, I'm sitting there thinking, well, that's the one-two punch with uh, with John Williams and, and, um, mm -hmm. And uh, what's his name? Um, Steiner. No, with, well, ben? well, and I'm not thinking for Star Wars, but uh, uh, but with um, God, what's the director's name? Um, Lucas. No, the other one. Uh, Spielberg. Spielberg. Oh, yeah, Spielberg. Oh. Well, Spielberg always uses John Williams, you know. Yeah, yeah. But but I always I always think of like I guess I put those two together because it's kind of like they fit each other's personalities, where the music. It does quasi compete with what's going on, but they they're more like dancing around each other yeah. than they are than they are competing, I guess. Um, yeah. But I mean, as much as I like, I love and and this is more Lucas, but you know the Indiana Jones and and the Star Wars music, and then uh, you know John Williams has done some other stuff later that I like also. Yeah. But but uh, in general, I don't. You know, I I actually view John Williams as a composer more than a film score writer. Oh yeah, no, I, he, I mean I think he I think he's considered more of a composer than okay. anything. Because because I kind of put him in that same bracket as Philip Glass, who yeah. who is a great great composer. I mean, one of the greatest living, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, when you see a movie and you hear Philip Glass, like it's almost more important than the movie. Like you know, it's Philip Glass right away. Yes. Yes, that and is. And that, that almost irritates me. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm kind of in agreement with you. It, you know, that's it's something I t said earlier. You know, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, if it takes away from the movie, that's, that's when it becomes more of an issue for me, you know? And it's one of those things it's like I can hear. And, you know, sometimes it happens with John Williams, you know, especially later on for some of the later movies he scored. You know, it's like, oh, this is John Williams' score, isn't it? You know, halfway through without realizing it's a John Williams score, and it kind of takes me out of the movie for a second. Exactly. Sometimes. And that's what I'm getting at with, like, the Philip Glass thing. As much as yeah. I, I mean, as much as I love Philip Glass just as a composer in general, yeah, it's it, he has such a style that you can identify right away that when you hear it in a film, you're like, oh, that's that's Philip Glass. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, without a doubt, that's Philip Glass. Um, so... Steiner is all over this list. Yeah. Because he did King Kong. He did, I mean, and granted, he's an older older gentleman, if you will. Yes. There was very few film scores. <laughs> There's yeah. a lot less film scores back then. <laughs> so um, I, I do love seeing that they have Ennio Marconi on here. Um, as uh, He's number 23 with the mission. So he didn't get uh -huh. on the... So the, so the good, the bad, and the ugly is not in the top 25. Wow. Which is strange to me. <laughs> yeah. And I was almost surprised. I mean, and this is where, I don't know if it's just my upbringing, you know what I mean? Because I watched those spaghetti westerns a lot. Yeah. But but I, I'm almost surprised that's not in the top ten, because that's that's ultra iconic. I mean. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. So, yeah, that's, wow. All right, AFI. Brave choice, brave choice. Yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> Um, I you know one other movie that just it just actually came to mind that I just surprised I kind of overlooked uh, for soundtrack that recently came out is The Artist. Oh okay yeah. You know that was a silent movie that came out now. Yeah. <laughs> so it was all soundtrack. That's one of those movies you kind of forget you're listening to a soundtrack because it's really helping tell the stories. You right. get a lot of that with the old silent movies, but. I feel the artist did it very, very well, and I mean that's why it won so many Academy Awards, in my honest opinion. But uh, yeah. I thought that was a very, very, very original, great score, and really helped to set the time, the whole setting of that whole movie. You know, really felt like golden age Hollywood when you listen to it. But it also really helped to drive the story, and it's one of those soundtracks that really needed to drive the story because there was absolutely no spoken word dialogue right that that seems like that seems like one of those situations where if if it was right it was going to be perfect and if oh. it was wrong it was going to fall apart big time yeah well i mean then that was it's very very brave by those filmmakers to make a silent film now you know oh, yeah. 
you know, especially with the YouTube generation, basically my generation, you know, we can't sit still for five minutes. Right. <laughs> right. No, that, well, let's, let's talk about that one for a minute then, because, uh, this is where, you know, the interest in art film. Yeah. And, and I mean, you know, I went to art school and I studied painting. So there, my, my interest in film, you know, movies are, I, I always had the separation of movies and film and i know that's horrible because that's not proper you know what i mean that yeah. just be just because movies are are made as a storytelling mechanism that does not mean art films are not and and yeah. vice versa just because an art film art art as a i'm sorry film as an art mm -hmm. uh more in a pure you know way of thinking just yeah. because its goal is not necessarily storytelling doesn't mean that those things can't be translated into a movie if that makes any sense so so they steal yeah. from each other i guess is what i'm saying yeah but um but it, like the the artist it kind of mm -hmm. goes into this weird place right where yeah. they're they're kind of transporting the experience of the watching of the movie as part of the movie Oh, yeah, it's the, you know, it's the old play within a play a la Hamlet style, you know, like. Right. So, so what's your take on that? I mean, do you think that there's, uh, like, I have this, I have this feeling as a painter that the, the cinema crowd today doesn't have the patience, doesn't have the, the, you know, the slow down and smell the roses to enjoy some of the finer things that you could do with film if they if they were able to do that but then, yeah. then there's a part of me that goes well maybe that format is just not in a big theater for for 15 bucks a person you know uh maybe that is where a youtube or, a, or something like i that agree comes with you. Play. go ahead yeah no i i i feel like i feel like with this with this movie especially for the year this movie came out and if you look at a lot of the movies that came out you had hugo you had you know a lot of other movies that really celebrated film in general film yeah. as an idea so i thought this was you know i think it was a perfect time for this movie to come out and i think it's like the only time for this movie to have really come out and done as well as it did yeah. i think if this movie came out any other year it, it would have done probably a phenomenal phenomenal film festival run might have seen limited release but you know the actual audience for that normally is very small right whereas that the year it came out with the back with the backing of movies like Hugo, you know, really celebrating old film and the beginning of film, and this is where we started, and this yeah. is where we're ending, you know, or starting to begin again. That you know, this comes a lot of these movies came in right as digital digital filmmaking was really taking off. You know, you had the social network at this right. time too that you know David Fincher filmed completely on Reds, yeah. you know. So it's it's really, you know, it's talking about, hey, don't forget our roots while we're moving forward. And for you people know? who don't know what f the RED is, that's a pure digital experience camera, right? Oh, uh, yeah, it's, yes. It's a very, very, comparatively speaking, it's a, it's a cheaper way to shoot a movie, but it's a very, very expensive camera that shoots a beautiful, beautiful image. If anybody has seen The Social Network, that movie was shot completely digitally on a RED camera. Camera. It isn't a red camera, like highly modular. Like you can change it up quite a few. Yeah, you can change ways. the you change the whole loadout to it. It it can get expensive, but um, you can really like just trick it out to whatever really kind of ways you need. You know, the actual camera is just this box that's got a lens mount on it. Yeah, like yeah. it's just a box, got a bunch of card readers, hard you know, hard drives on it, and you know, you attach eyepieces, you know actual displays different mounts all that fun stuff and so it works really really well so it's it's a film geek's wet dream <laughs> yeah basically. If, if that film geek is into digital filmmaking there's a gotcha. whole huge 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 debate that i'm sure we'll get into in another show yeah. about film versus digital right uh, there's a great documentary if anybody's interested to watch it you know sometime if there are any viewers out there it's called side by side Keanu Reeves, of all people, hosts it, but really? it, it's a great, great documentary. It just got put on Netflix, like, a few weeks ago. Um, no kidding. It is a great, great documentary that talks about digital and film 
and there's a lot of very, very important people who get interviewed. Lucas is interviewed at one point. You have Wally Pfister interviewed at one point. A lot of directors, a lot of young directors, a lot of old directors, a lot of cinematographers. Yeah, a lot, a very nice wide variety of people get interviewed for that, and it's very, very interesting debate. I actually sat down and watched it with my father, who yeah. has been doing film for a long time, and he, he, you know, he learned how to shoot on actual film. Yeah, right. You know, so the whole argument is, I mean, it really depends. You know, they bring it up in the movie. You know, film, we've gotten to like the peak of our process. Yeah. You know, there's not really, we can't make film really look any better. Whereas for digital, traditional, for traditional film, yeah, for yeah. traditional film and the actual chemical process of film, yeah. you can hold in your hand. Yeah. Um, whereas you know, digital, digital is like you know, right here, we're almost there, but there's still the gap. But the thing is, with digital, is we're only going to really, honestly, be able to go up. We don't know the top of the digital cinematography realm right. yet. And if we're this close now, and we're that this early in our technology. One could argue digital is going to surpass, but whole nother argument for a whole nother show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to have to have a show on that because yeah. uh, you, you constantly see, well, I constantly see just because I'm a nerd, you know, the 4K stuff being talked about. Yeah, and the... I mean, a lot of the movie theaters are totally now are all digital projectors. They're, most of them are 4K projectors. Yeah. Um, and most movies get shot in 4K, and 4K is becoming very inexpensive. 2K is becoming very inexpensive as well. You can buy the uh, Blackmagic Design Camera, which is a totally new camera. It's about three thousand dollars, and you can shoot in 2K in it. No kidding. Yeah, I mean, That's there's amazing. some, there's some, you know, there's some give or take with that camera, but it's you can you can effectively shoot in 2K for cheaper than a Canon DSLR now. No kidding. That's yeah. awesome. Wow. Well. um... What about, so if someone wanted to, like, go and watch a movie that's maybe out of the ordinary. Okay. Maybe maybe not a mainstream, you know, little unique, uh, niche kind of movie mm -hmm. that has a great either soundtrack or score. Um, I'll, I'll give you one that, that I think is good. And maybe okay. while I'm talking, you could be dreaming up yours, you know. Okay. Um, and this is stretching back. This, this is, again... Easily like, oh, well, that was going to come out of Matt's mouth, right? But uh, but the original, and this is going to be tough, because I think you can only get it on VHS, but the original overdub of Akira. Oh, man. So, not, only can you, not only can you only get that on VHS, you can, you can get it on Laserdisc. Oh, oh, <laughs> really? With the original translations? Yep, I have actually the full limited edition Laserdisc at my house. Oh, I'm... I may have to somehow rip that from you because oh, I'm yes. annoyed as oh, hell. Yes. <laughs> I got the I got the limited edition DVD release when it came out and everything, mm -hmm. and I was expecting that it, they had touted that they redid the dialogue to make yeah. it more accurate. But I was hoping that one of the extras would be to listen to the original dialogue, and they just totally stripped it. Oh yeah, they Lucas did. They and, Lucas. and it horrified me. I mean, I couldn't even watch it. I, I think I watched it once and never watched it again. Yeah. But but back to the music thing. Yeah. Is that that's one of those films that I remember, you know, kind of in the same essence as as um, Inception, and and I think that since Inception, that tactic has been duplicated because you see you saw it in um, that new Ridley Scott movie there. Um, per, yeah, Prometheus. Yeah. They use the big dawn, dawn yeah, kind yeah. of thing, and then now you're seeing it in a bunch of science fiction movies, like all over the you're, place. You're, and you're seeing it in every dramatic trailer ever. Oh yeah, <laughs> like, there, there's this big explosion, like this cacophony kind of limited, yeah. you know, ba 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 kind of thing going on. Yeah, exactly. But but Akira did that way back when as more of a marching tone, but it was the same exact effect. Yeah, uh, and yeah. and because it's you know because it's Japanimation, it's more a cultural thing, you know. I, I yeah. think from their era, but yeah, uh, but it had it had a great ambiance for music to fit the 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 speed and tone of the movie. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean that is that is a truly truly great film too. I'm glad you brought that one up. <laughs> I absolutely love Akira, and Akira has been really you know at least reference in a lot of movies and a lot of other things. Kanye West did a whole video for uh, Stronger, which is funny because he uses that Daft Punk sample for it, um, that he basically, the music video is Akira. 
Oh, I didn't know that. I'm gonna yeah. have to look that up. Really? Yeah, definitely. yeah. It's it's funny, you know. Kanye West is sitting there in the middle of a like a you know a bed. The, the whole giant machine's going around him, and Daft Punk's actually pulling the levers. They're supposed oh, to be the duck. Oh, no kidding. It's, it's awesome. It's a great that's, video. That's definitely making it onto the show notes page, because <laughs> I'm going to have to YouTube that after as soon as we're done with this. Absolutely. So, but can you think of anything like that that has, I mean, uh, you know, from again, I'll reference one of my favorite art films, because I think I said this last time we talked, was the Brothers Quay always pick great music. Yeah. And they're they're super super picky about the music, you know. Um, what do you think? I mean, is there anything like that that you can pull out? I mean, I I, I don't hit you on the spot, but yeah, I am um, man. I don't know. Uh, I have nothing really too particularly on the spot for that one. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's all right. Should that's a thing. Stump me though. I'm going to be thinking about that for a while. Ah. Uh. Well, uh-huh. have you ever seen the uh, have you ever seen the documentaries about like uh, they? I know Ridley Scott does a lot of these where they show him going through the directorial process of making. Yes, I have. And, and I remember. <laughs> oh yeah, well I remember the one when he was doing. Um, what was the uh, the one? Something with heaven. Um, what's the one with Orlando Bloom? And it's Kingdom, uh, Kingdom of Heaven. Yeah. Yeah. And they had a yeah. documentary of him yeah. making that, and they showed him going through all the possible music yes. to pick from, and uh, he had like literally stacks of CDs that they had him like listening to. And I, yeah. I just remember sitting there thinking, "Oh my god, this is just part of the process that no one thinks of." Like when you're watching the film, mm-hmm. you just think yeah. that some oh, musician definitely. comes in and magically makes it, you know? Yeah, kind of just waves his hands and. You know, the whole movie's perfectly scored, you know, like Yeah. So so from from that, I mean, what's the most normal thing? Do the do it does a filmmaker usually start making the movie and then like, like I've seen documentaries where the filmmaker will have something like Lucas. He always says he has music in his head when he's writing it and oh, when yeah. he's filming it, but then he starts showing the film to whoever, John Williams or whoever, and and they start writing to the movie based on what Lucas said he was listening to, and so they, they just have a launching point from there. But they ultimately yes. make fresh music. Is that kind well, of the I'll, norm? Yeah, I mean, I'll give you an example. I just did a, one of my short films not too long ago. I did a short film called Enough About Love, and uh, it was very basically it's about a guy who's existentially trapped in a children's book. Yeah. Okay. So we green screened the whole thing. We had very Dr. Seuss esque kind of illustrations in the back, but actual live actors and stuff. And while I was writing it, I was listening to the uh, soundtrack of Up by Pixar. Okay. Yeah. Great sound. You're from a little yeah. phenomenal, phenomenal. They always have great soundtracks. Yeah. Uh, so when I when I basically the caveat of this whole film that I was making the competition, we only had really a week to make it. So my poor poor film scorer had like two three days to create a score for five oh minutes yeah. so right. you know it's 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 only five minutes but it's still you know he has to layer different instruments and all that stuff sure. um and i basically told him hey this is the soundtrack i was listening to these are a lot of the i basically it was actually kind of cool i sent him over all the tracks over uh on spotify if you're familiar with the app yeah. oh yeah uh so, yeah, I would just send him tracks I was listening to while I was writing the whole thing. You know, this is what I'm listening to right now while I'm writing it. And um, basically, based off that, he scored the whole thing kind of, you know, in his own mind, but, you know, in a, influencing sure. all the stuff I've been listening to for that movie. You know, right. so it's, everybody's, you know, it's a, you know, as you know, you understand as a painter, process for everybody is different. Right. But... For a lot of film scorers who, you know, especially when you're working in a timed environment like Hollywood and all that stuff, yeah. you kind of got to be able to listen to some other stuff from the creative process and, you know, the whole creative team sending you stuff over. Sure. Well, yeah, I mean, and another example of that is uh, Wes Anderson, who's yes. one of my favorites. Notorious for... And, and he has his fingers all over the music of every piece because it's, it's oh, intimately yes. woven into the movie, you know? And uh, one of my favorite stories of him is uh, when he was making Rushmore, he apparently wrote it driving up and down the coast of California listening to the Kinks. Yep, no, and you can really, honestly, if you know the Kinks, you can really, really see it when you 
watch Rushmore. <laughs> well, and he, uh, apparently he petitioned the movie studios to say he wanted the whole, the entire um, soundtrack to be the Kings, mm -hmm. and they told him he couldn't do that. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, but uh, expensive. <laughs> but oh yeah, well, well, you know, and then I think they wanted the variety in there of yeah, other things. They you want know? to be able to sell soundtracks. <laughs> but uh, but his uh, his movies are another example, I would say, of something where you. Again, it kind of falls into that weird place where I think he's in so much control of the experience yeah. from from soup to nuts that that you know because he falls into that if you ask me the Woody Allen category of costuming and all that stuff too. Yeah, absolutely. So so you know the the music part for him always like that's one of the things I look forward to to going to a Wes Anderson movie is the music. Well, with with him too, it's like. It's the whole package. Everything right. is incredibly thought out from the production design to the set dressing to if you look at, you know, at one frame of his movie, you can look at it and you, you know he or somebody on his crew has placed things incredibly intentionally in that whole frame. Yes. Everything's symmetrical. So just the fact that he puts, you know, it's not surprising to me at all that he puts, you know, that much time and that much choice into his soundtrack. Yeah. No, that makes sense to me. I mean, he... And, and look what he produces. I mean, that, yeah. that's, you know. Exactly. If you, had, if you had showed me one of his recent movies 20 years ago, I would have been like, the, the guy's awesome, but he's never going to go anywhere. Or like, like, yeah. like totally unacceptable to the general public. But he's, but he's generally a hit, right? I mean, oh, yeah. generally, I mean, he does Kingdom well. Was, Moonrise Kingdom was a very, very big hit for him. And it, it, it had re limited release, too, right? Yeah, and it did, and it did very, very well. Speaking for limited release, and I think the Blu-ray sales have been really, really good for it too. Yeah, well, it's a fantastic. That's a fantastic movie. I mean, you, I mean, you can't touch that cast either. You know, Bruce right. Willis, Tilda Swinton, Ed Norton, Bill Murray, yeah. like just alone. Ed, just Ed Norton's character is one of my favorite characters in that. Especially movie. for Ed Norton, I just thought it was so funny. <laughs> and then, and then uh, Schwartzman's always in his movies. Oh yeah, oh, you he's. Know? His regulars, yeah. But uh, um, I'm trying to think of I, if I was to pick a favorite Wes Anderson movie, I, I still I think I still harken back to Rushmore. That's still probably my favorite one. Just yeah, I mean Royal Tenenbaums is my favorite, but that's also like basically the first one I've ever seen. Oh, okay. Well, Rushmore was my first one. Yeah, ever Rushmore saw, so. was my second. You know, once I saw that, I'm like, I really got to watch all this, all these guys, all this guy's movies. You know. Yeah. So yeah. I started more or less from the beginning. But um, Bottle Rockets really good too. I love. I, you know what? I I have I actually own Bottle Rockets and I've still never watched it yet. Really? Okay. I, I don't know how that even happens. But, I know what you're doing tonight. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, no. I mean, it's one of those. I don't know what. You know, it falls into one of those those. Like my wife's not a huge Wes Anderson film, mm -hmm. like you know, fan. Yeah. And uh, but I but I love it, you know. So it's one of those weird like I got to find the time to sit down and watch it where she's not trying to share the TV, you know, all that stuff. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, and then of course I got kids and everything, so they're going to be bored to tears with it. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. So, but anyways, well, that, you know, I think I think it's really fitting we we were actually talking about music this month because I actually got into a whole conversation at work not too long ago. For those of you that don't know, I do part time over at a movie theater as well. Um, for research. Yeah, for research, yeah. more or less. <laughs> um, it's yeah, you know, I get to see free movies all the time. It's really awesome. Um, so we got The Great Gatsby coming out. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. So for those of you who don't know, Jay Z executive produced the soundtrack. Oh really? Yeah, and this is actually after kind of a controversial whole big deal. Because the movie was actually more or less done almost last year. Okay. But it had a whole dubstep soundtrack that Boz Lerman put together. And the studio did not like it. <laughs> so they had to delay the movie to basically re-edit and recut the movie. And they decided to bring on Jay-Z to kind of help reinvigorate the, you know, the buzz for the movie. Really? To executive produce the soundtrack. Yes. So, have you seen the film yet or not? I know it's out. Uh, it's going to be out on Thursday night. Okay. Yeah, so Friday morning. It's okay. Place, but um, yeah, basically, there's. I've been actually. You can listen to the whole soundtrack. Actually, I think on NPR right now. Okay. Um, Jay Z did a, did a brand new song for it called "100 Dollar Bills." Really cool song. But a lot of the music is actually using jazz samples. 
to kind of help fit the period. Okay. This a lot was with Boz Lerman. Boz Lerman is very much a guy who focuses on his soundtracks. The thing is with Boz Lerman soundtracks is either you love them or you absolutely hate them. There really is no middle ground with Boz Lerman, I feel like. You know, you have his movies like Moulin Rouge, which are regarded by a lot of people as a very good soundtrack and, you know, it's a musical more or less. Um, but then you got, you know, people who are torn between his rendition of Romeo and Juliet. Okay. With a very young Leonardo DiCaprio. That, I was just going to say that. I remember that being highly modern. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They used guns instead of swords. It took right. place kind of a Mexico City kind of place, um, and they used contemporary music for the time. His Bos Lerman's argument, which is actually a, a a real argument, is that Shakespeare, when he wrote his plays, used contemporary music to help the plays move along and try and get normal people into the theater. Um, and that's kind of what Boz Lerman wanted to do, and that's kind of always been his style for soundtrack. Okay. Um, it was I when I heard originally that Boz Lerman was going to make an all dubstep soundtrack for The Great Gatsby, I I almost you know curled up into a ball and started crying. <laughs> You know, it's not that I don't like dubstep, it's just dubstep for the great Gatsby. It wasn't exactly what I was imagining for a movie when I was reading that book in high school. Yeah. You know, um, so now that Jay-Z's kind of stepped in and, you know, that the guy's musical knowledge, I mean, he's it's Jay-Z. Right. The guy knows his music for the most part. Um, you know, working with all these high-end producers, curating a really good, good soundtrack um, I think this movie has a great, great potential of being really, really good and really, re uh, having a really effective soundtrack. Nice. Huh. Well, well see, I, I, see the movie is first. But... Yeah, well, that, that's the thing. I mean, I, I, it's starting to come out. I mean, obviously, it's part of the buzz process, but, yeah. you know, there's a lot of articles and stuff right now being written about it. And I, and I, you know, it's one of those movies where I'm kind of like, eh, you know, I'd watch it, but I'm not like, I'm not like, oh my God, I got to go see the Great Gatsby, you know? Yeah. But um, but at the same time, that's the first I've heard of that. So that yeah. that definitely puts a different spin on it for me. At least. Yeah, I mean, if you really, if, if anybody's been watching the trailers too, a lot of it, you know, they use uh, "No Church in the Wild," which is that Kanye West Jay Z track with Frank Ocean on it. Okay. You know, I think that really, if it if it takes that tone, because you know that's a very a, a song Jay Z's on. You know. Yeah. yeah. If it can, if the movie can really take that tone, I think it's got the potential of being a very, very, very great new rendition of the Greg Gatsby. Huh, that's interesting. Well, yeah. well, that that definitely puts a different spin on it from what I. And again, I not that I knew a lot about it. I mean, yeah. but uh, um, interesting. Well, that'll be interesting to see what what that's like. You know. Yeah, exactly. I'm so. I'm, so I'm, uh, I'll have to. You're hoping that's gonna be good. I, I, I'm, I really am. I think it has, it has so much potential of being good. The cast is, the cast is solid. Bob and, who's, and who's directing it? Who's directing Bob it? Bob Lerman. Oh, okay, all right. It's the right, same right. guy who did Moulin Rouge. Yes, right. Yeah. Which, which was very good. I mean, yeah. you know, so it definitely works. Yeah, but you know, sometimes with his movies, they can, they can. He's got a really hit or miss career. Yeah. You know, Moulin Rouge is really the movie he's remembered for, but, you know, he's got movies like Australia, which I I mean, I enjoyed, but a lot of people didn't. That was a yeah. very long movie. Um, I mean, you know, I look over at his IMDb and then, you know, ha he's directed a lot of short films, too, but he really actually hasn't directed much. He's only been around since 92. But they, but like Moulin Rouge kind of had this very tongue-in-cheek kind of atmosphere to it in general. yeah like, it like, like i mean and granted i guess part of that's being a musical too you know what i mean yeah. like you, you gotta you're, you're already suspending reality a bit so so it's not shocker for it to be a little bit more you know a little bit more tongue-in-cheek i guess yeah absolutely um interesting well we'll have to look forward to that we'll have to yeah. so so i take it you're gonna go see that as soon as it comes out yeah, I'll, pro I'll probably get. I'll probably end up seeing it sometime this week. Uh, so we'll have to we'll have to revisit this next time we talk and and uh, get a get a review. I I'll tell you uh, the latest movie I saw was uh, Iron Man three. Yeah, what you think? I I uh, well now, 
let me let me preface this. <laughs> Long time comic okay. book collector. Yep. And uh, early, you know, and and influenced by comics and my painting and all that other stuff. So um, there were parts of it that I was disappointed with, and there were parts of it that I thought they did really well with. Um, and I don't want to ruin the movie for anybody, but it, it's uh, it's a uh, it's a solid you know um, a minus type thing. Yes. Me. It was it was a fun movie. It was fun. It was fun. But I took my nine year old. He he had no problem with it. He liked it. Exactly. You know. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I will say that I'm just that guy that, uh, I, I don't care. <laughs> this is, this is, this is a, a horrible statement. So everybody's <laughs> going to judge me instantly, but I don't care about anything else. I just want to see a guy in armor kick people's asses. Yep. And so not- there uh, on that aspect of the movie, I wish it had a little bit more. Yes. Yes. Um, but I've always liked um, Guy. Uh, what is it, Guy Pierce? Guy Pierce, yes, yeah. and he's in it. Um, yep. Ben and then, Kingsley. Uh, yeah, Ben Kingsley. Who, who I gotta say, I was disappointed in the whole situation the Man- with Ben. The Kingsley. Mandarin was the was the disappointing part. It, it really was because yeah. I I actually had hyped it up for my son who does who has never read Iron Man as a comic book. And I and I'm like, oh, thank God they picked like one of the mainstay real villains that everybody can say, oh, at least they picked a good Iron Man villain, yeah. and then they kind of ruined it, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, unfortunately, and um, unfortunately that you know that kind of happens with these movies, especially you know it's its third it's its third one. They they did so financially well with Avengers that yeah. I'm sure there was studio involved and stuff oh, like yeah. that. But that's well, that's and, and, was... and financially, from all reports, it's killing it right now. I mean, it's yeah. it's doing oh, yeah. very well. It's, we were we were um, the theater I work at was absolutely bananas. Bananas. Oh, no I worked. I pulled so many. Today's my only day off, actually. Oh no, that's kidding. how crazy this movie's been. Yeah, um, that's good. I mean, I mean, you know, I, I got to be honest. I I I think the superhero movies are in their renaissance right now because of the special effects. Oh yeah. When when I was a kid. It was one of those you didn't want to watch a movie about a superhero because you were like, "Nah, it's just not as good as the comic book." Yeah. It's just and and now it's hard to debate that. I mean, the movies are as well designed. Like they're pulling off the things that used to only be doable in the comic books. Yeah, and, and I mean, like you could some people could argue, you know, what what do you think is more critically acclaimed? You know, it's like, is the Dark Knight more critically con- acclaimed than the actual book it's based off of now? I, I would still I would, I would still say no, but yeah, <laughs> but, and I would too. But you know, you have people who have you know saw the movie first and then read the book, right, right. You know, but there's some of those people might say that the movie was really more important to them. That's a that's you know? a tough one. That's a tough one, and that's probably you know what that could be a whole episode because yeah, there's sure. there's <laughs> a, there's many many instances where I would make the argument that that the movies try and it's a typical problem i'm sure is that you can't yeah. take a book that takes you three days to read and cram it into a movie yeah no you can't that, that you're going to see in two hours i mean i i get that um but uh but going back to our conversation for today <laughs> not, yeah. not to derail us too much but i uh, i will say if we want to talk about the music from iron man uh i think iron man's a good example where pop culture music actually helps it quite a bit because oh, yeah. it helps, absolutely it helps in personalize the way Tony Stark is and all that. I'm not going to ruin anything by saying this because it happens in the first two seconds of the film, but it, you know, the film starts out with uh, blue by yeah. Eiffel 65. Like, yeah, that was, I mean, I remember sitting there just being like, what, you know, I'm thinking the projector's messing up, you know, maybe the projectionist is, you know, screwing with us or something, right. but you know, no, no, that's how the movie starts. And yeah. it, it totally works. <laughs> like it, it does. They, they made it work perfectly. It was, yeah. And you know, it was one of those things that it kind of, you know, made the scene even kind of a little bit funnier too. No, it was, it was, it was good. They, they did a good job with it and it wasn't Favreau or whatever who directed it this time. Right. It was no, a different guy. Uh, Sam Black is his name. I think it was, it was a different guy and you could yeah. tell like it had a different feel to some of the, the way it was, you know, in general. Yeah. So what's his, is it, is it Sam Black? I think it's Sam Black, right? Uh, but yeah, it, it was good though. I, I did like it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so, no, uh, it, was, it was solid. And for any viewers who haven't seen Iron Man yet, please stay till after the credits are over. 
There is an extra scene at the end, for those of you who don't know. Every Marvel movie really has it. Stay. Yeah, you know what? We we didn't stay. Oh, um, you didn't? I didn't. Well, this one I, doesn't. This this ending doesn't allude to anything like was, that's going to be set up in the other movies. It just kind of ties the movie together in a nice package. And okay. It was funny. I uh, we it was a choice to leave because I knew it was going to happen. But, yeah. Uh, but I was uh, the movie was actually longer than I thought it was going to be. So yeah, it was one funny. of those. My wife, my son had a baseball game, and my wife was waiting for us to pick her up. So we were. Yeah, we're not gonna wait. We're getting out of here. You know? Yeah, you had to, to rock and roll, yeah. rock and roll out of there. Shane yeah. Black is the director, by the way. Shane Black. John Favreau is does have a cameo in it. Yes. Oh yeah. Well, more yeah. than a cameo, he's one of the yeah. characters. Yeah. I and mean, he's a, he's a more or less a character in the series yeah. now. Yeah. I wonder if he'll be actually in the. They're coming out with a TV show for the Shield agents. Oh really? Yeah, and I I bet you money he'll probably be in it. Well, that's we'll have to see. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Well, any any fleeting shots on film music that we haven't discussed that that you want to make sure we squeeze in? I mean, uh, I, I realistically, what what do you think? Maybe the worst scored movie ever. Oh, just, that's like, a just good. That's a good question. <laughs> um, you know, I, uh, I well, it's not so much worse music is the fact that there was no music is old country for or country, no country for old for, yeah no country yeah. for old men um my wife and i when we watched that we were kind of like it needed music and it and, and i know it was a choice like they did it on yeah. purpose to not have music but it, it kind of bothered us to not yes. have music you notice that you had no music yes it takes it takes you out of it because yeah so so that I mean, I know that's not really the question. That's more of just something that I viscerally responded to. Yeah. But um, uh, I, you're going to hate me for this. But I actually really hate Greece. <laughs> like the music. I, I, know, I, know, I, I can understand why it, why people do not like that musical. Yeah, I just, I mean, and, and I don't know if it's because of, like, my, it, it's really my parents' era and, yeah. and that doesn't like nothing against my parents or what they like or anything like that. But I just, I'm I'm just not a huge. I think it's been. I, I don't know. I don't know what it is about it that I don't yeah. like. I'm just I just me myself and I just personally not a big into the Greece thing. Yeah. Um, and then when they made Greece too, it was like even worse. You know, it was just yeah. awful. Um, so I, I'm not a big fan of that, and I'm also not a big fan of the new whole thing with uh the glee and all that stuff i'm just not a guy that's into all that stuff i i know i know many 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 people who love it and and i don't knock them but at the same time it's just not me i'm not that kind of musical guy you know yeah um i mean i think mine honestly is and this is really kind of vague yeah but uh ghosts of mars 2001 it's a oh, yeah. movie uh, I, I, that, mm, mm, I couldn't, no, I couldn't do it. Go, I could. Wait a minute, maybe I'm thinking of the wrong one. Ghost, not, that, not the, nice you. not that, the Disney, not the Disney movie. No, it was, it was more of like, you know, sci-fi horror-esque, you know, the oh, late. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Ice, Ice Cube, Jason Statham's in it. Uh, yeah. Natasha. It trying to be like an action film, like a yeah. sci-fi movie, yeah. yeah exactly. Uh, it was. It was, yeah, that was, I don't know why, it just wasn't, it was very synthy, kind of annoying. You know, Jason Statham seems to pick movies that have crappy music. Yeah, no, I definitely totally. and, and, and And I hate to say that, because I actually like some of his action movies and stuff. Oh, yeah. But, but his they all are fun. Oh, yeah, but they, but they all seem to have this Euro trash music kind of thing going on, which yeah. is really annoying, you know? Um, I will say really quick, too, my favorite, my favorite, the best worst soundtrack ever? Sure. Space Jam. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Space Jam. That's seriously guilty pleasure. I will listen to that soundtrack all day, every day. But Space it's still one of the best Jam. soundtracks ever. <laughs> like, Space Jam, huh? I, uh, I, I wouldn't have thought it, that. Name it. Like, come on. <laughs> well, if, if we're going down paths of worse, you know, things like that, I would say things like the Ninja Turtles movie and stuff oh, like that, you know? Yes. 
Yes. <laughs> oh, I, man. Vanilla ice on that. Oh, man. <laughs> well, well, they. Uh, uh, if you want to talk about a soundtrack that's iconic, but I hate it, is Ghostbusters. Uh, okay, okay. The, the I mean, yeah. <laughs> saving the day crap, and it's so, I mean, it's very indicative of that era. Yeah. But it's, but it's really just like, the, it, it was honestly meant to last two weeks. Like, there's yeah. just no redeeming quality to it for a long stay. And for, and for that movie too, you know, that's supposed to be very, you know, you know, Bill Murray tongue-in-cheek humor. Yeah. You know, that's very kind of cheesy. Yeah, really, so, no, really. I mean, it's surprisingly cheesy for, yeah. for you know. So, anyways, yeah, there, there's plenty of horrible music in movies. Don't get me wrong. God, yeah. So, I, I'm sure if I if I put more thought into it, I could probably come up with something truly, truly distasteful. But, yeah. But, uh, you know, and then, and then art movies usually have the worst. Like, they, they're trying to make noise core into some kind of soundtrack. Yeah, they're doing something, you know, some guys just, you know, on drugs, po poking a synth. You know, kind of yeah. just like, oh, I like this one. Yeah, I'm going to hold this for a while, you know. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it fit the frame. Yeah, what? it fits the frame, man. fits the frame. What, what does that even mean? Well, <laughs> like... well I, will, I will tell you. Now, this is fraying a little bit away from film, so mm -hmm. forgive me. But, I, but okay. I will say one of my favorite, favorite, favorite soundtracks that's popular music soundtrack okay. is from a video game. And it's from Wipeout XL. I know exactly which, the soundtrack you're talking about. <laughs> which is, well, and, and I'm going to mention two, actually. The Wipeout yeah. XL, which came out on the PlayStation 2, I want to say, or something like that. Mm -hmm. But it was yeah. a fantastic video game, and it, they used all British underground synth uh, artists. So yep. you, had, you had very early Chemical Brothers, you had Junkie XL, you had, um, you had Fluke. You had. Um, it was I don't PlayStation know. One, by the way. Was it PlayStation One? Yep. It was, and it was a good game, by the way, too. Oh, it was yeah. a very good. Great game. But but I remember getting addicted to that soundtrack. Underworld was on it. The Orb was on it. There were a bunch of uh, Future yeah. Sound of London. There were a bunch of great synth bands on there. Jap Punk was on there too, weren't they? I don't think they were. If they were, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look it up really quick. Yeah, uh, I mean, um, but that that's that's one of them. Yeah. The no, other one. Jap Funk was on it. Music was on it. Oh, music. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. 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 So, so that's a great album soundtrack for anybody who wants to listen to a great soundtrack. Yeah. The other one that's a little harder to find is Jet Grind Radio. One of the one of the best it, games ever. Is I, that not absolutely. is that not a game that is defined by its soundtrack? Like. Oh yeah, and same and, with same with its sequel, the uh, Jet Set. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, and if and you can buy that, and the album's like twenty something songs long. It's a huge album. Yeah. Oh yeah. And it's great. Like it's it's Tokyo pop is basically what it oh. is. So so it's a bunch of kind of off genre for American culture, synth meets like guitar rock type stuff mashed together. Yeah. And um, I'll tell you, a great band that came out of that was a Guitar Vader, and then and yeah. then also. Um, this band was not part of that, but they're of the same genre, which is Buffalo Daughter. But they're, it's just great, really offbeat music. Really yeah. offbeat. But it's fantastic. So, anyways, yeah. if someone were to put that in a film, I would be an instant fan. Like, ah. I wish I saw more of that music in film. Good yeah, exactly. Back. Exactly right. <laughs> no, note to self. Yes. You'd have a hit on your hands if you use yeah. that kind of music. Yeah. Just, uh, you know, just make, I, honestly, I think I'd... Jet Jet Ryan Jet Set Radio movie would almost be kind of cool. <laughs> that would be that would be awesome. I yeah. would love that. Yeah, I would love that. And it's having a little bit of resurgence right now because they just ported it to all the mobile devices. So yep, yep, they did. So you know, everybody's starting to play that again. And there's yeah. been you know whispers and rumors for years and years and years for you know a new version or something coming out too. So well, hopefully the, we get something soon. But who I, knows? I was gonna say if if they see a spike in interest because of this release, maybe Sega will get off their asses and do it. You know. I can only hope. I, I can know. only hope. That's a great game. So. Yeah, it's an awesome game. Okay, well this is great. We're right up on the time limit here, so Sweet. fantastic. <laughs> thanks again, Kevin, and, yeah, and we'll be we'll too. be talking again. Absolutely. All right, thanks. I'll yeah, have a great one, guys. See you.